Men do tend to shut down after sexual intercourse, so you'll have a complete drop. For women, it could be harder to fall asleep, which is just interesting because... Nicole Vignola. A neuroscientist and author. Helping you rewire your brain so you can sleep better. And how much sleep do we need? And if we don't get enough sleep, what are the consequences? Between seven and a half to nine hours. So we sleep in 90 minute cycles. So there's a really interesting study that was conducted a couple of years ago. And what they did is they put individuals on six hours of sleep. And in one week, they had altered 711 of their genes. Now, what that means is that half those genes were upregulated in a way that was increasing inflammation and tumor processing. It can you know, lead to anxiety, stress, potentially even depressive symptoms and um, irritability. So what does help us sleep? What are some proven remedies to help us unwind? Definitely a breathing routine. We used to say no carbs after eight, which is crazy because carbohydrates actually help increase serotonin. Serotonin gets metabolized into melatonin, which puts us to sleep. So those are two really um, helpful tips. One that I think is, is especially important is... This episode is dedicated to anyone who gets totally freaked out when somebody puts a full stop at the end of their WhatsApp message. I know you've probably heard this a million times on other podcasts, but following or subscribing really helps the show. And the more followers we get, the more likely it is that I'm able to book new, exciting and insightful guests for the show. So if you subscribe, I will continue to keep to my word and promise to never let this podcast be sponsored by Huel. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with a really simple question that applies to everyone listening. Why do we need sleep? Ooh, a very big question. And I think most people will agree that they probably need to work on it a little bit. Is that maybe an assumption I'm making? So a couple of things happen. Well, a lot of things happen when we sleep. Predominantly when we go into deep sleep, so the first two, two stages of the night, you go into very deep sleep slow wave sleep. That is where your brain is essentially recovering from the day. You have something called the glymphatic system. Now the glymphatic system is a little bit like a washing machine for your brain. It comes in and it releases cerebral spinal fluid into the brain and it clears out all the toxin buildup from the day. When you, when that machinery or when that system is not working effectively, you get a buildup of a composite. So that can lead to irritability, increased stress, potentially tau buildup. Tau buildup is strongly linked to Alzheimer's. So, you know, that might be the sort of long, long end game of what's going on there if you don't get regular sleep, good quality, regular sleep. And someone with ADHD, they're often, they try to go to sleep and then their mind fires up. Some of my best ideas come to me at 3 a.m. in the morning. Yes. What's going on there? Yes, I love this question. So it's really interesting because I'll give you a bit of background on the brain and ADHD. So we have these three major systems in the brain. So you've got the default mode network, which is your default mode of thinking, internal mind wondering, creativity. You know, those thoughts that spontaneously arise when you're doing mundane things like washing the dishes or folding your laundry or 3 a.m. and lying in bed. <laughs> then you've got the central executive network. That's the network that you're probably in right now. You're paying attention to me. You're thinking about higher order thinking, problem solving, maybe to some degree. And then you've got the salience network. Now, the salience network it de determines which network is more important. Now, with individuals with ADHD, there appears to be an asynchrony or a time delay in these networks. So what will happen is you are concentrating on something and then the salience network will start attaching salience importance to the default mode network. So you start mind wondering when you should be concentrating or vice versa. And that is why sometimes in the, someone with ADHD will be mid conversation and start thinking about that email that they didn't send, right? Can you resonate with that? Absolutely. It's quite common. And so what's interesting about you saying that you're having these thoughts at three a.m. is that you're in that internal mind wandering. Your brain is very active in that default mode type thinking. And it's a very creative place to be in. So it's 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 obviously a detriment that it's happening at 3 a.m. But it also means that you're having your most kind of powerful creative thoughts in that time because your central nervous system is very calm. So you're able to think more openly and creatively. It's hugely relatable to myself and I'm sure many of the listeners. Yeah. More broadly, do dreams, do they serve a purpose? Yes, I mean, it's a very 
Interesting question. We don't fully understand. And some people dream more genetically, some people don't. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're sleeping better or worse, but it does appear that dreams are our way of processing thoughts, feelings, emotions, events from the day. Because what's happening when you're sleeping is norepinephrine levels associated with stress are lower. So you can think about the day's events without the stress involved. So you can compartmentalize and you're sifting through those thoughts, through those dreams and alleviating the emotional friction. So you've had a very stressful day or maybe something happened at work. You may go to bed worrying about it, but that's your brain's way of compartmentalizing the emotions and removing that emotional friction from the thoughts. Are there ways we can tell how much sleep we need and if we're getting enough just from day to day function? For example, do food cravings mean that we're not getting enough sleep? When you perceive something stressful, adrenaline goes up, then cortisol increases as well. What is supposed to happen is that cortisol is supposed to communicate with the brain and body that the system is a negative feedback loop. It's supposed to shut down the stress response. When that stress response doesn't shut down because we have a plethora of problems in our lives and we can think about them as well to add another layer to it, that cortisol remains elevated. And cortisol is responsible is responsible for um, glucose metabolism. So that's why you get sugar cravings. You crave carbohydrates when you're stressed because the brain and body is trying to release more glucose into the system for energy to run fight or flight from the threat that is being perceived. So could be, yes, uh, you'll find that your, your brain and body are trying to hold on to some kind of energy because it's not receiving it during the sleep. But, you know, sugar cravings or did you say sugar or just Mm, food cravings? Sugar cravings particularly. Yeah, can definitely be related to sleep. And how much sleep do we need? And if we don't get enough sleep, what are the consequences? Between seven and a half to nine hours. So we sleep in 90 minute cycles. So that's why we say eight hours, because if you go to bed uh, at, say, 10 p.m., it will maybe take you about half an hour to fall asleep uh, generally, hopefully anyway, and then you get seven and a half hours of sleep. So anywhere between seven and a half and nine. There's a very small population of individuals that have a genetic subtype that allows them to sleep for six hours, but have the same effect as though they slept eight hours. It only affects around 1% of the population. So if there's anyone out there that has that gene, then they are very lucky people because they can just sleep six hours and have the same level of replenishment. There was a really interesting study that was conducted a couple of years ago, so in 2022, in the PNAS, which is a very highly reputable journal. And what they did is they put individuals on six hours of sleep. And in one week, they had altered 711 of their genes. That's 3% of your genome. Now, what that means is that half those genes were upregulated in a way that was increasing inflammation and tumor processing. And the other half were downregulated in a way that was impacting individuals' immune systems. So people, you know, would have, if they had done more longitudinal studies on that, they would have seen that people may be getting more sick um, uh, more regularly. Now, inflammation in an abundance can have a a wide variety of effects on the brain and body, but it it can, you know, lead to anxiety, stress, potentially even depressive symptoms and um, irritability. And if someone is listening and they are feeling worried that they are sleep deprived, are there any other consequences, for example, on the stress hormones, cortisol? Yes, so it will exacerbate that that feeling of being easily triggered as well. So if you have a pool of, say, mental currency or mental capability that you can give if you're sleep deprived you'll you'll have less available we call it hrv so it's your heart rate variability so if your heart rate variability is low it means that you have less resources to give if you will and being sleep deprived pulls on those resources so your your cup or your energy your your battery power doesn't get as replenished if you will and if we have a great night's sleep What is happening inside our brain and why do we need that to be happening? So that lymphatic system, hugely important for, you know, clearing our toxins. We also release very important hormones when we're sleeping. So predominantly growth hormone during deep sleep, which is responsible for cell repair and testosterone. Now, we need testosterone, both men and women. And what we've seen is that it's predominantly released during REM. If you're losing an entire cycle of REM sleep because you're sleeping six hours versus eight, that amounts to around 10 to 15 percent of less testosterone per day just by losing one cycle. So it is hugely important to get as much sleep as we can. You know, I appreciate that it's a very, very difficult conversation to have around sleep because I think the majority of people, including myself, 
struggle with you know those ruminating thoughts at night or waking up in the middle of the night so hopefully after this you'll have some tips on how to improve that sort of sleep hygiene the ruminating thoughts do you think that's the main reason why people with adhd struggle to sleep or do you think there's more there Ruminating thoughts, but also active thoughts. You know, I th- I, a lot of the people that I speak to have a lot of creative thoughts at night, uh, predominantly with ADHD. And, you know, that could manifest into ruminating thoughts if there's anxiety and stress involved. If not, then it's just that kind of activity. I have a friend, and this is an anecdotal kind of suggestion, but she um, she has this kind of like sleep uh, revenge she doesn't want to go to sleep because she's having so much fun being awake, <laughs> but then suffers the next day. I don't know if you can resonate with that. <laughs> yes, I can actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get, you get hyper-focused on a new hobby or a new task and yes. it comes out of nowhere. Exactly. Suddenly you're decorating your flat at 1am and you should be sleeping. <laughs> yes. And I nap a lot. Um, is it good to nap or should you fight off the urge and save the tiredness till the evening? So it's a choice between what do you want, right? Do you want to continue to decorate your flat at 1 a.m. and then take naps during the day? Or would you rather, you know, increase that sleep uh, resistance or sleep need, if you will, and save it all for then going to bed at a more reasonable time? You know, it's 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 down to the individual. There is research to suggest that um, biphasic sleeping, so four hours and then four hours again, has similar effects to sleeping eight hours. But it does appear that sleeping consistently throughout, you know, that whole eight hour cycle serves its own purpose. But naps are good. Naps are really good. I actually did my research in um, attention and how we essentially use attention and and resources, mental resources. So for lack of a better term, I've called it mental currency. Obviously didn't do that in my thesis because my supervisor probably would have, you know, expelled me. But (laughs) to make it easier to comprehend, it's this mental currency of available money that you have to give on things. And by napping, you're kind of filling up the bank again. If someone's listening and they, they can't nap, they get to the evening, they're quite tired, then they suddenly get this excitement in, into a new hobby. They get extremely passionate about something which stops them from being sleeping. But they have something they need to be awake for at 9 a.m. the next morning. Mm-hmm. What advice could you give to someone who's in that particular position where they have to sleep because they need to be alert and awake at 9 in the morning, but they've suddenly been sparked awake by a passion at 1 a.m. in the morning? So, so is the question about going to bed and having that thought or waking up at 1 a.m. and having that thought? If you've been awake all day, say... And you're winding down for the evening, but then, then at 1 a.m. in the morning, you suddenly get an exciting thought and you get a burst of energy to start a new project mm-hmm. and you can't sleep because of that energy. Mm-hmm. But they need to sleep because they've got to be awake at 9 a.m. in the morning. Mm-hmm. In that moment, is there some, some things that person could do to mm-hmm. wind down? So, something like the physiological sigh, where your breathing to calm down your central nervous system can help you to reactivate a parasympathetic system, which then tells you that it's actually time for sleep. Now, that looks like a double inhale through the nose. So, <sighs> should we do it once together? <laughs> Let's okay. do it. Does that feel nice? Let's do one more. I don't know about you, but I feel quite yeah, okay. euphoric. Yeah, I can feel a little bit, yeah. a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. Do one more. Yeah. One, do one. <sighs> yeah. How many times would I need to do that? Depending on where you're at on that kind of alert scale. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's 10. I've gone on to public speaking events where I've had to do 20 and my heart's still pounding through my chest because I'm talking to professional athletes. But that's, you know, so it depends. But that is essentially communicating with your brain and body that you're in a state of rest and digest. So you should go back to sleep. Now, another hack is that you could potentially say, okay, fine, I'm going to attend to this because we, we've we spoken about that salience network attaching importance mm. to particular things and someone may struggle to let go of that, which is fair enough. So you could put on a timer, attend to that thought for 10 minutes, maybe journal it, maybe write it down. And then when that alarm goes off, that will snap you because that sound will snap you into thinking about something else, which is then your cue to go to bed. Is there anything else someone could do? If they they lie down and suddenly their mind starts racing, 
they're unable to sleep. In that moment, when they're lying in the dark with a racing mind, is there anything they could do in that moment? Something like a, like a spot check. So working from, you know, thinking about how your feet feel, how your calves feel, how your thighs feel. Doing a spot check where you're paying attention to something else that's not the thoughts. So that you're essentially redirecting all of that attention and energy into something that's more directed, if you will, can help you to then, because with those thoughts left unattended, we can go off on a tangent and it can be quite fun and creative, but it also means that then we're sort of racing with our minds. Um, what I will say is that everyone, including ADHD, is have, we have very plastic brains. So the more you train your brain to come back to center, the more you teach that attentional network to let go of those thoughts that are racing and come back to something that is central, you will get better at doing that over time. It's a skill that can be learned. So they did a study where they they taught ADHD is, and this was specifically in ADHD, and this is why it's really important because a lot of research is done in neurotypicals. This one was done in individuals with ADHD, and they saw that in a 17-minute meditation session, there was already increased plasticity in the frontal cortex. So by practicing meditation in the day, you're essentially teaching your brain to centralize your thoughts so that you can then practice that at night and be able to translate that into something that is then useful for you know, those thoughts. Is there a type of meditation that's particularly effective? Anything where you learn to not attach yourself to the thoughts, because again, coming back to that salience network, that's the predominant kind of underlying theme with anyone, but predominantly with ADHD is, is the attaching yourself to that thought. So waking up at 1am, having an idea and thinking, I have to go and attend to that. So anything where you can teach yourself to observe the thoughts and let go of them, that's a really good type of meditation. Um, something like self-hypnosis as well is hugely um uh, effective for ADHD is and anyone really because what they've seen is that when we practice self-hypnosis and there are apps for this you we increase something called GABA in the limbic system now GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter which slows down the communication of neurons firing so if we have an abundance or at least an increase of this neurotransmitter we can slow down the activity that's going on now what's interesting is that ADHDs do have a deficiency in this GABA neurotransmitter. It's the reason why you'll wake up at 1 a.m. with racing thoughts, etc. So something like self-hypnosis can help in that um, of slowing down of the, of the communication. Do you think people with ADHD need more sleep than neurotypicals? No, depending, you know, we're, we're all different. You know, so it, there's studies to suggest that women need more sleep than men, uh, but I wouldn't say that they need more or less. It's just that maybe... They, they definitely struggle more, for sure. That, that we do know, <laughs> unfortunately. Sleep deprivation, that's used as torture in yes. some places, yes. which says it all. Yes. If, what are the consequences of severe sleep deprivation? Well, what's something that's really interesting is the reason we hallucinate when we become sleep deprived, and I've never been so sleep deprived that I've started hallucinating, but we know that that happens, is because the serotonin receptors become more um, apparent in the brain. So they, they, they rise to the surface um, areas, so they increase in surface area on in the brain. And serotonin is responsible for hallucinations. That's why uh, psilocybin, psilocybin works on the serotonin receptors. And it's the reason why we start to hallucinate. So that's just an interesting fun fact. Uh, but yes, it's, you know, it's, um, we start to feel delirium and we start to feel out of control when we haven't slept enough. You know, so that, that irritability, that snappiness, the inability to think clearly, you know, psychomotor activity is involved. I mean, there is rumors and speculation that the Chernobyl um, uh, nuclear explosion mm -hmm. happened because of sleep deprivation. You know, some debate around there, don't take my word for it, but, uh, you know, Dr. Matthew Walker talks about that in his book, which is just interesting because the less sleep we have, the more mistakes we start to make. The, You know, we, we know that that happens. I mean, I do some crazy things when I haven't slept properly. <laughs> it's like I wanted to be a doctor and I just genuinely think the world was looking out for everybody else because if I had, I think I would have killed someone by now, <laughs> to be quite, quite frank. <laughs> it sounds like it's probably a good idea then to hear your proven remedies to unwind and foods that help people sleep. But first, I want to hear about your ADHD item. 
Every yes. week I ask my guests to tell me an item that most represents ADHD in their life. There we go. It's a passport. It is a passport. I'll pass that to you and explain why your ADHD item is a passport. Um, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure I have ADHD. I do have a COMT mutation, which is associated with ADHD. I've just never had an official diagnosis. But I'm always losing things, predominantly passports, keys my mind I actually landed in LA and lost my phone within two hours of being there which is just very telling of who I am as a person and I think that sometimes when you know I when I th thought of the item I thought I could see how someone with ADHD would be thinking about so many things that the passport would just form part of the background and then you get to the airport and you're like hang on a minute I need that piece of paper to get into the country and to exit so I don't know if that's <laughs> did you find your phone in LA? I did. Oh, good. Someone found it, actually. They drove it two hours away from LA because they wanted to keep it safe, so I had to go on a little adventure to find it. But they found me on Instagram and then returned it to me, which is pretty wild. There we go. Some good people in the world. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Very thankful for that person. I'll she take was the great. passport. It will grace the, the background shelves of all the past ADHD items. Okay. Put that there for now, but we'll find a better spot for it later. Uh-huh. There we go. Um, let's talk about your book. Rewire. So break the cycle, alter your thoughts and create lasting change. How did that come about? I always knew I wanted to write a book. I just didn't expect to write one so soon. I, I felt like Big Nicole would have written one, but then uh, Penguin approached me and I already had some ideas and it, it sprung because I, I, I feel like a lot of people have these confines or the boxes that they put themselves in this narrative that we repeat to ourselves maybe it's a story that says you're not good enough you couldn't oh you could never do that because you're not xyz and i and i hear that a lot so i wanted to challenge the idea that the programming that we have is from our formative years which meant that someone else did that for us and is our programming really yours and if it isn't then you can change that because we know the brain is plastic it can create change all the way into old age so anyone that feels stuck rewire equips you with the tools to be able to access neuroplasticity and essentially become whoever you want to be i want to find out some proven remedies to unwind because i know there'll be a lot of people listening who really struggle to do that mm -hmm. So what does help us sleep and what are some proven remedies to help us unwind? Yes. Uh, so what's really interesting is I spoke about the GABAergic activity in individuals with ADHD. Now, there's a compound called glycine, which is also an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now, it doesn't directly increase GABA itself, but it's co-authors, if you will, with inhibiting the brain's activity, predominantly in the brainstem, which is responsible for breathing rate, heart rate, etc. So eating foods that are high in glycine, because glycine is an amino acid, can actually help you enter those deep sleep stages. So things like rice, uh, you know, turkey, chicken, soya beans, you know, I, I'm not here to talk about food ethics. I'm just giving out the information and people can take what they need from it. You can do a, you know, abundance of research online as to what foods are high in glycine, but white rice appears to be quite high in glycine. So it's interesting because we used to say no carbs after eight or whatever. That was like a diet fad, which is crazy because carbohydrates actually help increase serotonin. Serotonin gets metabolized into melatonin, which puts us to sleep. So we should actually be eating um, carbohydrates late at night or at night for dinner. So anyone that struggles to sleep, increasing your carbohydrate intake, which increases serotonin and increasing the glycine intake, which can help to inhibit the, the brain's activity and help put you to sleep at night. So those are two really um, helpful tips. There's so many. Uh, one that I think is, is especially important is putting your phone away probably about an hour before bed. Now, I have a COMT mutation. So what that means is that my brain doesn't have enough enzymes that break down dopamine. So when dopamine is released from the synapse, it doesn't then get reuptaken as it should or broken down. So I'm very easily stimulated by uh, phones, you know, co consumation of information. So if I don't put my phone away at least before 8 30, 9 o'clock at night, I'm I can guarantee I'm not going to be asleep by 10, 10, 30, 11. It's it's a chore because you know we all love to scroll late at night in bed. It's like my favorite pastime. <laughs> <laughs> but I just absolutely can't. And it's interesting because most people when say that say to me they struggle to sleep and the first question I ask is what time do you put your phone away? They all go, oh yeah, okay. 
every single time without fail, people will admit that they're scrolling on their phones mm. too late at night. Now, the problem with that is that you have different frequencies of brain activity. You've got gamma, the highest, beta, alpha, theta, delta. To get from beta activity, which is where you're at on your mobile phone, down into a delta slow wave brain wave, you're having to go through all of these different phases. So how can you be scrolling in a beta state and then expecting your brain to just switch off and go to sleep straight away and then enter a deep sleep stage? So putting your phone away at a good time before bed is always a good idea. The other thing that happens <clears throat> is that artificial light impacts our dopamine production. So especially after the hours of 11 p.m., we have an area called the habenula, which creates dopamine when we sleep. And it is impacted by artificial light because our eyes are the windows to our soul, quite literally. They communicate whether it's daytime or nighttime outside. And if you have artificial light in your face, your brain thinks that it's still light outside and it doesn't trigger those mechanisms that say, is we should now wind down and go to bed. And then you add that other layer where you're impacting dopamine production, you wake up feeling less motivated. We know that dopamine dysregulation is a symptom of ADHD. So it is in everybody's and especially ADHD's best interest to put your phone away at a reasonable time at night. Probably the hardest hack, but the most return on investment. <laughs> Apart from mobile phone use, is there any, any other big mistakes people are making in the evenings, in the lead up to bed? Name a few and I'll let you know. Do you have any ideas of like something that you could be... Eating sugar? Yes. So, okay. Sugar in abundance, bad. Sugar, as in from your carbohydrates, as I've just spoken, not necessarily. You know, you've got this glycemic index. You also have a, um, a level at which you can tolerate. So I would refrain from simple sugars, chocolates, ice creams late at night, for sure. Again, dopamine dysregulation. You might find yourself then clutching on to wanting more right before bed. So ideally, yes. But if we're talking about sugars as in carbohydrate sugars, then I've already said that it, it, rice is a good idea. What about watching TV? Is that similar to going on your mobile phone? Depends. So some people, so if you're watching something that is sort of slower paced, then that may not impact you as much. I would say that there's a scale. What can you handle? I can't handle mobile phones. I can't really handle TV, but someone else may be able to handle TV, but not phones. And it does require you to truly assess whether that is something that you can do. Some people fall asleep in front of the TV. I don't know. I'd love to look at maybe a sleep polysomnography and see if they're actually getting good quality sleep. For some people, it helps that background noise, especially ADHD is again, maybe that background white noise is helping you create an ambiance where you can fall asleep. So, you know, the, the logical answer is to say refrain, maybe read, but everybody is different. What about exercise? Is that good before in the run up to sleep? Again, depends on how how conditioned you are. You know, if you're somebody that's not used to exercising and you start an evening routine, you may feel too too high to be able to come down enough to be able to sleep. Like my partner was doing jujitsu until 10 o'clock at night at one stage, and that was just detrimental because at 11.30, he was still wired. So, you know, it all depends on how high you raise your cortisol and then how quickly you can actually shift back into a state of parasympathetic. Most people have a dysregulated nervous system, I would say, that doesn't allow them to be able to switch effectively between both. So, you know, if, if the trade-off is not exercising because you can only do it at night, then I would say, you know, probably still exercise, but maybe assess the level of intensity. One of the things that I think people do and think that helps them sleep is alcohol. Unfortunately, alcohol does not help us sleep. It helps put you to sleep in the beginning, but it hugely dysregulates your sleep cycles. It's the reason why you drink and you wake up at three, four in the morning. Can you resonate with that? Mm. Yes. So we have a natural cortisol um, uh, cycle that determines our sleep wake cycle. So when we wake up, our cortisol levels rise. They start ri rising around three hours before they peak. When they peak, that's when we wake up. The brain says, okay, we're awake now. And then you have ebbs and flows with daily cortisol from stresses. But usually what happens is the sleep wake cycle that's or the cortisol that belongs to the sleep wake cycle. No, let me just reword that. 
this cortisol that is associated with the sleep-wake cycle that determines your whether you're awake or asleep drops before bedtime and then is the lowest while you're sleeping and then it starts peaking around, again around 3 a.m., 3, 4, depending on when you wake up. For me, it'll be around 3, 4 because I wake up quite early. <clears throat> when we drink alcohol, we're spiking that cortisol to come up higher sooner. So you may drink until 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock, whatever time it is. And what that does is that it's shifting the entire cycle earlier. So you start peaking at around 3, 4 a.m. So that's why you start tossing and turning after a bender. Have you ever had that? Yes. I definitely have. I'm like, what is going on here? So it helps you fall asleep real quick because it's a depressant. It slows down brain activity so you can go to sleep quite Mm. easily. But then that cortisol is shifted so you wake up earlier when you shouldn't be. Just zooming out for a second, is there a difference between stress and anxiety? There's an overlap. So... What I would say is that stress and anxiety can trigger one another, but stress is more along the lines of there's a stressor or there's something that is stressing you. And if you were to remove it, that stress would come down. With anxiety, it's persistent in the way that even when you remove the stressor, the anxiety is still there. That is because it's internally generated. There's a concern there about something that is not related to an external pressure. If someone's feeling anxious in the run-up to sleep for whatever reason, are there any on-the-spot practices someone could implement to help with that anxiety? Definitely a breathing routine. So before bed, something like that physiological sigh, which can just communicate with the brain and body that you are not in a state of threat. When our anxiety is high, when our stress levels are high, what's happening in our brain is that our brain is saying we need to fight or flight from the situation. And so we need to communicate with the brain and body that there's no threat in our environment and we can recover back to a parasympathetic state. With anxious thoughts, they keep that system alive. They keep that fight or flight, sorry, they keep that fight or flight sympathetic system active so that you then struggle to fall asleep. So you can fast track that by having the body communicate with the brain through breathing that there's no threat in your environment. So that's step number one. Step number two, having something like a hot shower can lower your body temperature because homeostasis, when you're in heat, your body's trying to cool down. So it drops body, body temperature. If you're cold, it will increase body temperature. So having a hot shower lowers your body temperature. Body temperature is associated with sleep. Our body temperature is lowest when we're sleeping. And it's the lowest a few hours just before waking up, about an hour and a half before waking up. So by having a hot shower or a hot bath or whatever, you're triggering that thermodynamic system that says, hey, let's lower our core body temperature. It is now time for sleep. Sleep and having an intimate partner Evolutionarily, do we sleep better if there is someone we love close by? Depends. So, anecdotally, I remember when George and I first got together, he falls asleep really quickly. So it kind of like, we have something called coherence. Our brainwaves can match. So we're probably matching right now with our brainwaves. It's quite interesting. It's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon where... Over time, the more we converse, it's almost like we're dancing, right? Our brainwaves match each other's well, you frequencies. And me right now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we're having a little internal mind to mm. tango right now. <laughs> <laughs> terrible at dancing. That's okay. <laughs> it's a mental dance anyway. Um, so what, was ha- what, what happens is our breathing rates match, coherence, especially if you're close to someone, have you ever had that when you're lying in bed and then you start to breathe at the same mm. rate that they are? So for me, that was hugely helpful because George just scrolls on his phone, rolls over and falls straight asleep. And then his frequency was impacting my frequency, frequency, which helped me fall asleep. But I don't think that there's any harm in sleeping in separate rooms either. Some people don't sleep well with people in the bed with them. And I think that we've societally maybe attached that to being something wrong with the relationship. But maybe you're a light sleeper. Maybe you don't sleep well with someone in the bed with you. So it's just you have to assess whether that works for you or not. For me, it works some days and other days it doesn't. And then George will just be like, I'm going to go sleep in the other room. And I'm like, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to a, another guest on this topic and getting intimate with your partner. Mm-hmm. Is there an optimal time to get intimate with your partner in the run up to sleep? It's different for men and women. Men do tend to shut down after sexual intercourse. So you'll have a complete drop, mm. which is great for you. For women, it can be different. There can be more activity, mental activity, which can mean that 
it could be harder to fall asleep. So again, it depends. When we are intimate before sleep, we increase levels of oxytocin, vasopressin, serotonin. Serotonin, again, is quite a calming neurotransmitter for men. Men tend to drop off the cliff. Uh, women, not always. So yes, it, it can be unwinding because what is also happening is you're completely immersing yourself in something else. So you're able to not think about the day's stresses because what tends to happen is if you go straight to bed, you're worrying about the day's events. Whereas being intimate with someone can help you to completely take your mind off things. When you then come back to the stressful day, because they might pop up again, you will have more sort of, uh, of a logical mind state reinstated and you won't have so much. Have you ever had that when you have something, a stressful thought, you go away, you come back and you see it from a different perspective mm. that is what mm. is going to be happening there do you have three tips that someone could implement if they're really struggling with sleep that might help them unwind in the evenings breath work something like the physiological sigh increasing foods that are high in tryptophan which increases serotonin which increases melatonin and then foods that are high in glycine glycine is the amino acid that helps to inhibit activity in the brain and then having a hot shower which will lower core body temperature and trigger the system to go to sleep i'll add in a fourth one just because i have to limiting phone use at least an hour before bed and i know there'll be a lot of mothers listening parents who have children who they struggle to get to sleep do you have any tips for that particular audience? No, and it's the reason why I don't have children. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. It's yeah. a good answer. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's so hard, right? I mean, mm. and every child is different, which is I have huge compassion for mothers and parents who have children that don't sleep. You know, uh, potentially implementing these tips on their children, you know, helping them find a system that can help them unwind. And then again, through that coherence, through that brain frequency, maybe having something that helps everyone just calm down, whether it be maybe playing puzzles at night, having a games night, having something that can just help really relax the entire household. Maybe have a, you know, again, hot showers, hot baths, children have hot baths. And then what the brain really loves is routine. So like clockwork, we go to bed at 10, we wake up at six. Again, those hours can differ between individuals. I'm just giving that a suggestion. I don't expect anyone to wake up at 6 a.m. if they're not morning people. That's a whole topic in itself. But clockwork, the brain likes routine. So mm. if you know that it's now 10 o'clock and the brain has been doing the cycle over and over again, it will eventually become something that the brain will look forward to. So I know that at 10 o'clock we start to unwind. There's clock genes in our DNA which tell us you know, where we are at the time of the day, which can determine how we then regulate our circadian rhythm, our own internal circadian rhythm. Are there any other beneficial effects that a really good night's sleep will have that a lot of people won't even be aware of? Improved mood, but improved dopamine production, which can help you with productivity, goal setting, and especially with ADHDers who may have a dysregulation in that system. Mm. Do you see a common cycle revolving around phones, lack of sleep, and coffee the next morning? And does this affect our mental and physical well-being? Yes, 100%. There's some really interesting studies that were done in teenagers showing that when they, you know, they, they go to bed later, it really impacts mental health. Can't remember the statistics off my hand, off by uh, off by hand. But as I mentioned, that artificial light is impacting dopamine production, which is not just there for productivity and uh, goal setting motivation. It's also there for mood. So a lot of mood disorders are associated with lowered levels of dopamine or dysregulated levels of dopamine, which can impact your self worth, which can which can impact your confidence. It can impact your entire life and then also increase this negativity bias that we have as humans so we start to attach ourselves to more negative aspects of our day and tend to overlook the positives of our day fascinating yes just finally nicole i want to do the washing machine of woes and it's the hottest day of the year today so my sweaty hands are going to not let me grab the washing machine there we go it's just about 31 degrees without the air con yeah, just constantly. for anyone listening so you know while we're melting away melting. here <laughs> just sweating for the fun of it <laughs> Gosh, thanks for bearing with it. Um, every week I ask my Instagram community for their biggest ADHD Ooh. woes, and it goes in the washing machine because for me, the washing machine represents my biggest woe, which is memory loss. I always <laughs> oh, no. leave my laundry in the machine. Do you do that? Do you have memory loss or did you just not encode the memory because you were thinking about something else? Well, I think I got distracted by something else. I, probably was, I think TJ Power said that when I 
decided to put the washing on, I was in a high dopamine state. Yes. And then when it finished and it was my turn to do the, the task of undoing the washing machine, un- unloading the washing machine, um, I was in a low dopamine state or distracted by something else. Yeah. So you weren't encoding the memory. Yeah, I mean, all. that's a long way of saying that I just forgot. Is, it, is, is there more to it? Well, I just think you probably just didn't pay attention to it. So the memory didn't stick because you were thinking about something else, mm. you know? So I think a lot of people think they have memory loss, but actually they just didn't make the memory to begin with because they were living in the future thinking about something else. So you put your keys down. You didn't forget where you put your keys. You just didn't remember where you put them down because you didn't make the memory in that moment of where you put them because you were thinking about something else. So through automatic patterns, you come in, you dump your keys anywhere and then do something else. Your mind is thinking about something. So you haven't forgotten where the keys were. You just didn't pay attention to where you put them to begin with. Okay, but my, my, my clothes are still damp in the machine. Right. How can I be more intentional then when I put my washing machine on that I'm not going to forget to unload it. Right, I see. Okay, so you are actually forgetting. Sorry, I, I completely um, misunderstood that. But yes, so TJ's right. You were probably in a, low, a, mo, a state of low dopamine, less motivation to want to do it. Could you put an alarm on? I mean, it's a good idea. If I, well, I remember to do it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's when sticky notes comes in and then I forget to put the sticky notes on. Yeah, you know what's interesting is sticky notes work for the first few weeks and then we start to, they start to form part of the background of our lives. It's like notifications. After a while, you're like, I know that I'm going to get that mm. email and I'm going to just ignore it because that is what the brain does. And it's great fun buying them. Yes. Sticking them up because it's new, it's a novelty. Yes. Then once they've been up for a week or two, they just blend in. That's the correct word. So novelty. When it's novel, the brain pays attention to it. When it is a novel, it becomes part of the background. So how can I maintain novelty when remembering to empty the washing machine? You need to hire someone to change the sticky note colour every few, <laughs> every, every so often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Or just, if I can't afford to hire someone, what, what could I do? Could you buy one of those wash? I mean, this is completely like bonkers, but could you buy one of those washing machines that this does the washing and drying all together on like one of those apps? Well, mine was, but it is, is kind of broke. The drying feature it doesn't really work anymore. Right, okay. So it has to be dependent Physical, on me. Physical, manual human, labor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you put an alarm on your phone? I like think one that's of, what I'm... Like one of those that kind of is really annoying. You have to tend to. Like the sticky note you can ignore. Mm. The alarm you can't because again, it's just going to be annoying. Mm. Are there any other just general tips? You mentioned the car key example earlier. Again, it's the same psychology, right? Between why I'm forgetting to do something that I intentionally planned to do in the past, but now it is in the present and I've just, it's left my consciousness. Yes. So you've got to try and learn to slow down, you know, pay attention to everything when you come in put the keys on the thing that I don't have. And it's the reason why I lose my keys. Hang up the jacket, take off the shoes and just really teach your brain because you can to pay attention to all those small moments. And over time, you'll learn to slow down. You'll start to remember the things that you should be doing because with ADHD and, and anyone, but predominantly ADHD is that when you're living in the future, you're not thinking about where the keys are. So you're not encoding that memory. So you haven't forgotten. You just didn't pay attention to it. By slowing down, we're saying, okay, keys are here, snapshot memory of where they are. Jacket is here, snapshot memory of where that is, and so on. Fascinating. I'll let you know how I get on. Let's find out what's in the washing machine this mm-hmm. week. Someone has written in and they've said, I've never been a good sleeper and get up every two hours and struggle to get back to sleep. My husband is exactly the same. Would it be detrimental to our relationship if we slept in separate beds? Kind of answered that earlier. No, not detrimental at all. If anything, I think it will help when we can detach from that idea that we should be sleeping together as humans. You'll start to see that you'll probably get more benefits it'll probably increase more love and affection throughout the day because you don't want to be irritable about, you know, around someone. So I would say it's definitely not detrimental. Sleeping with earplugs or blackout room can really help as well because if your brain is having to process sensory information like noise, light, etc., there's still some level of activity there. Whereas if you remove all of that, the brain can completely shut down. I have a little funny story if we have time. I was on holiday with my friend Lucia in Arizona and I was sleeping with earplugs in and my toothbrush went off in the middle of the night, my electric toothbrush. Mm -hmm. She thought someone had broken into the room. So she was freaking out 
she went to the sliding door. She hasn't she hasn't got her glasses on, so she genuinely like feared for her life. I'm like away with the fairies. I literally I woke up the next day and I was like, Are you okay? And she was like, I woke up four times because your toothbrush kept going off. <laughs> and I was like, I had no idea. I literally had like the best night of like sleep of my life. Cause I sleep with earplugs in, which it's kind of bad when you think about it because I could have been murdered in my sleep, but then who cares, right? I would have just died in my sleep peacefully without <laughs> knowing that I was getting murdered. So <laughs> I sleep really deep with earplugs in because my body and brain just can really shut down into that slow wave sleep where you shouldn't be waking up. So maybe in blackout curtains, mm. there's so many tips. I have a whole chapter of sleep in my book with all of the tips that I um, suggest because there's so much that we can do. And I think people need to take what works for them. But shutting down that brain activity by including earplugs and blackout masks or blackout curtains can really help. And just giving the brain the best chance it has at being able to wind down. You mentioned your partner was able to just go on his phone for a little bit roll over and get a good night's sleep. Do yeah. you think he's actually getting a good night's sleep? No, <laughs> no. And, and he knows that. I think, so I don't want anyone t hearing this who can fall asleep straight after scrolling on their phones to think that it's okay to do that. It's, it's great that he can do that. It's a testament to his ability to switch off from things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting good quality sleep. Because as you remember, I said, we have to go from beta activity, alpha, theta, delta, if you're in beta by scrolling on your phone, potentially even gamma because you're watching something triggering or you're in the comment section arguing, you're going to have to go through all these layers to get down to a slow wave sleep. And that's going to take time and process. It's going to delay the whole onset of the sleep cycle, which can impact you know, all the physiological mechanisms involved in replenishing your body with sleep. There'll be a lot of people listening who have a partner who will say that drinking alcohol helps them fall asleep. From your scientific background, what would you say to that person? It's probably helping them fall asleep, but it's not giving them the quality sleep that they need. It's also affecting the sleep cycles within that. So the REM sleep will be off. The deep sleep is probably not being reached the way that it should. And the cortisol increase will be shifted forward. So they'll be waking up earlier on in the day. And if not waking up, tossing and turning and not getting that quality sleep that they need to feel great the next day. So it does help put you to sleep but it doesn't mean that it's actually helping you recover at night. To add another layer to that, and you guys can decide how to edit this in, if your body is having to metabolize something like alcohol, it's always going to prioritize that first. So it's not going to have time to then replenish the system, to replenish all of the cells that need to be recovered in the nighttime. So it's going to prioritize alcohol, which means you won't be feeling waking up, you, you won't wake up feeling great. It'll also be increasing cortisol levels in the long run, which is going to be affecting the entire system, increasing inflammation. Chronic inflammation can lead to autoimmune disorders. It's, it's a cyclical pattern that just keeps you stuck, but isn't actually helping you feel better. And then you go to bed at night thinking, I need a drink because I feel rubbish and I won't be able to sleep without it. And so the cycle goes, you know? We have a closing tradition on the podcast, Nicole, and that's I ask all my guests to... Share their most impulsive thing they've ever done. Oh. You can have a pause if you want to think about that, actually. Well, I mean, we did move. I feel like my whole life is pretty impulsive. I feel like every 10 years, I seem to move somewhere. So the first 10 years, I didn't have a choice. My parents moved me to South Africa. But then when I was 19, going on 20, I just, drop of a hat, thought I need to move to England. And I did. I came to London with one suitcase. And then recently my partner and I decided that we were going to move to Madeira. The move to Madeira is not impulsive because he's from there, but the time frame in which we decided we were going to move was impulsive. We came home from skiing, got home, had a breakdown about the weather, and then we just literally went on Skyscanner. We're like, yeah, those are the flights, book them, let's go. And it was four weeks after we had come back. So that's pretty impulsive. Is there any fear there, any, any anxiety in taking these big decisions? No. No. I thrive with change. I love it. I'm like, give me adventure. <laughs> Let's do it. I'll always figure it out. I had a lot of anxiety moving to Madeira because everything is on the other side of the road and going to the store was like, you know, a, a palaver and a, 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 an experience in itself because the usual things that I would buy are not in the place that I would know where they are. And then I'm now trying to figure out what I'm buying. So I ended up buying like 
terrible margarine instead of like butter that I was looking for. So it was like, you know, I kept buying the wrong things and then having to either return or throw them away, which is not mm. great. So, but I also do appreciate that the chaos is part of it. I'm like kind of thriving it a little bit <laughs> in a good way. Truly fascinating. The whole episode has been brilliant. Yeah? Nicole, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.